Well, Jesus, thank you that you have stepped into history and taught your people. Thank you that your spirit filled your apostles and you could pass your teaching on to them and they could pass it on to us. Thank you, Lord, for your word in the scriptures. And as we tonight read it and think about it and discuss it, I pray, Lord, that you would um, deepen our love for you, make us more aware of your love for us, um, and let the hope we have in you shine through us in your world. Jesus, we ask this in your name. Amen. 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 Right. I suggest that we look at Luke chapter 21 and reading from verse 5 to 37. Quite a long passage um, and lots of debatable points. And there, it's probably part of the scriptures that has Christians most eagerly disagreeing with one another in terms of what it actually means. Um, and I have had uh, many debates with people about uh, what it means, the A. What are the famines and pestilence and, and people trying to calculate when the second coming was going to happen? So I have tended to um, avoid these apocalyptic passages um, and uh, so I'm not going to come with any kind of clear, deep teaching. I think to, to get, get into this properly would probably take a three or four hour long Bible studies to get our heads around it. But I thought as we're looking in Advent at the second coming and uh, last week we were looking at Jesus as our hope in the future, we may as well look at it. So we'll read it through. Um, and I'm probably make one or two comments. And then if there are things that have struck you or questions you have or, or things that, you, um, that you've heard people say that have read with you, let's uh, use the opportunity since we do have the facility to engage with one another to have a bit of engagement around the passage. So reading from Luke chapter 21. Uh, some of his disciples were remarking about how the, two, the temple was adorned with beautiful stones and with gifts dedicated to God. But Jesus said, as for what you see here, the time will come when not one stone will be left on another. Every one of them will be thrown down. Teacher, they asked, when will these things happen? And what will be the sign that they're about to take place? He replied, watch out that you're not deceived, for many will come in my name, claiming I am he and the time is near. Do not follow them. When you hear of wars and uprisings, do not be frightened. These things must happen first, but the end will not come right away. Then he said to them, nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes, famines and pestilence in various places and fearful events and great signs from heaven. But before all this, they will seize you and persecute you. They will hand you over to synagogues and put you in prison and you will be brought before kings and governors and all on account of my name. So you will bear testimony to me, but make up your mind not to worry beforehand how you will defend yourselves, for I will give you words and wisdom that none of your adversaries will be able to resist or contradict. You will be betrayed, even by parents, brothers and sisters, relatives and friends, and they will put some of you to death. Everyone will hate you because of me, and not a hair of your head will perish. Stand firm, and you will win life. When you see Jerusalem being surrounded by, by armies, 
you will know that its desolation is near. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let those in the city get out and let those in the country not enter the city. For the, this is the time of punishment in fulfillment of all that has been written. How dreadful it will be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. There will be great distress in the land and wrath against this people. They will fall by the sword Will, will be taken as prisoners to all the nations. Jerusalem will be trampled on by the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles are fulfilled. There will be signs in the sun, moon, and stars. On the earth, nations will be in anguish and perplexity at the roaring and tossing of the sea. People will faint from terror, apprehensive of what is coming on the world, for the heavenly bodies will be shaken. At that time, they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. When these things begin to take place, stand up and lift up your heads because your redemption is drawing near. He told them this parable. Look at the fig tree and all the trees. When they sprout leaves, you can see for yourselves and know that summer is near. Even so, when you see these things happening, you know that the kingdom of God is near. Truly, I tell you, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Be careful, or your hearts will be weighed down with carousing, drunkenness, and the anxieties of life. And that day will close on you suddenly like a trap. For it will come on all those who live on the face of the whole earth. Be always on the watch. And pray that you may be able to escape all that is to happen. And that you may be able to stand before the Son of Man. Each day, Jesus was teaching in the temple. And each evening, he went out to spend the night on the hill called the Mount of Olives. And all the people came early in the morning to hear him at the temple. All right. In the Gospel of Luke, this takes place just before the crucifixion. Jesus has entered Jerusalem with acclaim at the uh, on Palm Sunday, and he spent the rest of that week going to the temple and teaching. And it was during that time that he taught the people. Now, whether this was all spoken at that point or whether Luke as a um, good editor has taken various teachings that he had about the end times and put them all together in one place, um, I'm not quite sure. Um, it could be either. We sometimes tend to, to read scripture through, well, we always do, through 21st century eyes. And, and we look at what we would expect today from a good reporter or a good historian. Whereas in actual fact, um, we need to, I think, sometimes read the Gospels more like a film script, where if you take a, any, any book that's been turned into a film it very seldomly follows the the book sort of word for word step for step by step but the people uh, will, will put things together leave certain things out um, flesh certain things out a bit more because that make it, that makes the film work and sometimes uh, that um, the gospel writers they haven't uh, made things up, but they've put things together in different ways for different purposes, depending on what their point of view is. Um, and a very good illustration I've heard of this is if somebody gives you a box of family photographs and asks you to put it in an album, you could put it in an album entirely chronologically you could put it into albums by various family groupings. 
You could put it into an album with uh, events so that all the weddings are together on in one section, all the parties in another section, um, all the newborn children in another section. And each of those are valid ways of arranging the material, um, depending on what your, your perspective is and what you're wanting to communicate. Similarly with the Gospels, the Gospel writers have got all the, the stories of Jesus and they're bringing them together with certain intentions in, in view. And so um, sometimes where there's discrepancies between Gospels, people say, ah, they obviously not sort of can't be telling the truth. You say, no, they are. They just sort of have different um, uh, ideas. They have different uh, perspectives of what they're trying to achieve. And so how Luke put this together, um, I dare say there are books and books written about it, but it's all a, a whole collection of teachings about Jesus referring to the end, prompted by the, the uh, apostles looking at this, this magnificent temple that he was in and remarking on it. And the temple at the time was probably one of the, probably the most magnificent building in Israel and one of the great buildings of uh, the ancient world. Um, and it had been adorned with all sorts of beautiful stones. Um, people had given gifts um, dedicated to God and uh, used it to beautify the this, this temple. Um, and so... They make this passing remark about how beautiful the temple is, and Jesus gives them this warning. This whole thing is going to be torn down, um, and not one stone will be left on another. And we know that 70 years later, that is exactly what happened. In AD 70, the Romans sacked Jerusalem, destroyed the temple, burnt the city, drove all the, the Jews out, and I think for the next couple of hundred years, it was illegal for a Jewish person to be caught in Jerusalem. Um, and so as Jesus speaks, as with a lot of prophecy in the old in the Bible, there's sometimes a, a dual focus. And the one is a, a more immediate, uh, closer to the time. So Jesus looks and says, this is going to happen. And part of the prophecy is looking at uh, the fall of Jerusalem in AD 70. But then there's a whole lot of the, 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 uh, the prophecy, which also stretches far into the future, where he talks about uh, the, the signs in the heavens and uh, wars and rumors of wars and all those things. That's looking much further into the future to the second coming of Christ. And so you have this close by and distant uh, perspectives in the prophecy. And one can see it as well in some of the Old Testament prophets where uh, people like uh, uh, Ezekiel end up uh, preaching that there's going to be uh, a restoration and there's going to be a new king. And yes, that did happen when the Jews returned from exile, but there's also the prophetic looking at Jesus as the king of kings and the the, the son of David uh, being crowned as the, the, the great king, the, the final king. And so in the Old Testament, there were those two focuses. And similarly here, the one you can see aspects of it um, in the near future and other aspects further down the line. Um, and I think the... Uh, the warning Jesus gives in verse 8 and 9, uh, don't be deceived. People will come in my name claiming I'm he and the time is near. Uh, don't listen to them. And for the last 2,000 years, we've had people saying that, coming on the scene, uh, 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 claiming that they are Jesus come back that they are the Messiah in some way, and they're, they're constantly appearing. And you also have a lot of people preaching, oh, the end is nigh. Um, and in some instances, it doesn't really matter. You just say, well, that's great, that's fine. 
but sometimes uh, some people are taken up by it. And I know of people that have gone off and cashed in their pensions, sold their houses, given all the money away because the world was going to end in two months time. The, the numbers were clear and the dates were specific. And so they went out and, and they, they did that. And <laughs> two months time came and the end of the Jesus didn't come on the clouds. And so the preacher revised his dates and, oh, no, sorry, we've got, I'm a year out. It's, it's coming next year. And next year came and went and uh, a whole lot of people left in poverty uh, because they believed teaching. They claimed to know exactly when the end was going to happen. And Jesus is quite clear. Do not believe people when they say this is it. The end is near. But at the same time, he later on says, um, when you see these signs happening, know that the end is coming. Not that you go and sell everything, but that you prepare your heart. Um, and he says, uh, we go down to what's it, 30, 36, be always on the watch. So we must always be ready. And be always on the watch and pray that you'll escape what is coming on the earth. And I remember back at school, we had a teacher that was very keen on trying to work out exactly when the second coming was going to happen and when the end of the world was you know, saying to people, oh, you need to be ready, it's coming in the next five years. And he just said to him, well, sir, if a bus hits you this afternoon, your end of the world comes now. So make sure you're ready now, irrespective of when the end of the world might actually happen. We have to be ready all the time. So Jesus is looking and saying the end is coming. Be aware of it. Don't be deceived. Don't be gullible. Um, but be prepared in and of yourself. And some of the things that come up for me are uh, almost a comfort rather than encouraging. So where he says, a nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes, famines and pestilences in various places. Um, and as one looks through world history, and as you just watch the news today, you see this happening. Um, and as you look at the world, you know Jesus said this was the kind of world we would be living in as we get closer to the end. Um, and each day we're one day closer to the second coming. Um, this is where, to, to try and think that the world's going to be miraculously better um, is uh, wishful thinking. Jesus has said there's going to be war, there's going to be pestilence, there's going to be all these problems. Um, that's what the world is like. Um, and so for me, that's uh, as we face the, the pestilence of COVID as we hear of uh, the ascendancy of China and we uh, see the problems at North Korea. Uh, this isn't that God's plan has gone wrong. This is all Jesus said. This is the kind of world that it's going to be. Um, and nothing's failing. We're still on course for the second coming. Don't worry about it. And then there's that, that passage on persecution. They will seize you and persecute you and put you in prison. Again, this is, um, in the near term, this is exactly what the, the church experienced with many of the people being persecuted within Jesus' lifetime. Well, not Jesus' lifetime, within the lifetime of the apostles. And you certainly look at the apostles, there's... Um, Really, only John that we're aware of that ended up dying of old age. All the others were arrested, persecuted, um, and executed. So that suffering came upon them in the short term. But at the same time, in the long-term view, we mustn't think that being Christian will make us popular in a world that is anti-Christian. And we've, we've had, I think, a number of centuries of where the church has dominated Western society um, and has uh, had society aligned with the church and upheld in various ways certain Christian values. And so things like uh, uh, laws around marriage, laws around keeping Sunday, 
uh, as a special day, that you shouldn't work on a Sunday, that businesses and banks are closed on Sundays, etc. It was all just part of society. Um, I think as we go into the future, it's going to be less and less so. Um, and more and more, as people try and maintain Christian values um, and keep the faith, there's going to be more pushback from an increasingly pagan and non-Christian world. Um, and I think it's, it's going to be a challenge for the church because if you think back, and I think just judging by the people here, uh, everyone was, is of an age where you can remember that uh, Ascension Day was, was a public holiday. It used to be a day of school. And so there were Sunday school picnics and all sorts of other church events and services on Ascension Day because it was a holiday. Um, in the last 20 years, it's no longer been a holiday. And so suddenly, well, we won't have church services. We won't do um, any of those kind of activities because it's no longer a holiday. And maybe we're getting to the point where Christians need to follow what Muslims do. We just put in a day's leave. It is uh, a Christian holiday. We will take the day off work and go and celebrate Ascension Day. And I think we'll, we'll get to the point where things like Easter, um, well, fortunately, Easter is a, uh, a Sunday always, but Good Friday may not be a holiday, and we'll be challenged to um, to be prepared to, to make a stand. Um, and I think the church, um, as it tries to uphold biblical morality, is going to face more and more pushback from society. Um, and it, it becomes a challenge. And part of the problem that we face at the moment if you look around the world, is that in countries like America, much of the church is, is politically aligned. And so um, when the church starts speaking about things like abortion or gay marriage or um, uh, Sunday uh, observance, it's aligned with a certain political party and it starts becoming party political rhetoric rather than Christian testimony. And that's um, certainly is, is problematic. Um, hopefully we don't end up in that position in South Africa. Um, but yeah, uh, it, there are going to be people that will stand against us. And Jesus says, everyone will hate you because of me. Uh, we haven't reached that point yet, um, but we may yet. And he says, it's not, just going to be the, those people over there, but people close to us. And I think anybody uh, that has um, tried to keep, a, take a Christian stand in the face of uh, family pressure will know what Jesus is, is speaking about. Um, where if you're in a, a family which is not Christian, to try and maintain a Christian standard and go to church, um, it may not be hatred, but there's constant needling and, um, and pushback from family. And Jesus said, expect it. And then he continues, when you see Jerusalem being surrounded by armies again, that happened sort of 40 years later at the fall of Jerusalem. And certainly the experience of the people in the city was get out and keep away, don't go near the city, which is what he was saying. But at the same time, there's then this uh, prophecy looking to uh, the second coming. And it's passages like this that uh, certain people pick up on and it becomes part of politics again. And we, we see a number of uh, Christians in America siding with Israel, although they much of what they say and do is anti-Semitic, they want Jerusalem re-established because they believe that this is then fulfilling this prophecy. And once they uh, have all of Jerusalem handed over to uh, the Jewish state, then the second coming can happen, um, which, I think is being over literalistic in, in the interpretation of the text. Um, and I don't think it's God honoring because to, to say that 
God's hands are tied. He can't come back as he might want to because we haven't got enough power to hand the whole of Jerusalem over to the, the nation of Israel. Um, God's, <laughs> God's not waiting on us to do anything. God works his purposes out. And then their signs, uh, the second coming is not just going to be political. It's not going, just going to be social. It's going to be um, cosmic. It says there's signs in the sun, moon, and stars. And there'll be anguish and perplexity at the roaring and tossing of the sea. Uh, the second coming, as Jesus returns, is not just going to be the rest of life goes on as normal and the Christians have a, an encounter with Jesus. Uh, the text, as you read through sort of the Bible, it says at Jesus' second coming, the whole of creation gets wrapped up. That's it. Done. It gets rolled up like a garment and packed away. There are other passages where it says that there will be a new heaven and a new earth, or the whole earth will, it will be recreated in perfection and evil will be taken out of it. Um, exactly how it's going to be uh, isn't specified in this. This text, but what it does say is that it's going to not just be a spiritual thing, but it is going to affect the universe as well. And when it happens, verse 27, at that time, they will see. This is he's speaking about people will faint from terror. Um, on the earth, nations will be in anguish and perplexity. People will faint in terror and apprehension of what's coming on earth, and they will see. So it's not just Christians will see, everyone, all the nations, every single person that is on the earth will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And so, again, it's one of those things that um, where somebody says, oh, Jesus has come, you just say, no, he hasn't, because we didn't see it. Every eye will see, the scripture says elsewhere. Um, uh, and if I didn't see it and you didn't see it, then it didn't happen. Uh, end of story. And they may they may believe what they like. Uh, and they may have their various bits and pieces and a text here and a text there to support the idea that Jesus has come again and he's in usually Arkansas or somewhere like that. And you just say, no, he didn't come again. That's not so. <laughs> uh, because every eye will see the Son of Man coming in the cloud with power and great glory. And as we look forward to that, Jesus says, when these things begin to take place, stand up, lift up your heads because your redemption is drawing near. And we need to remember, I think what Jerry was saying on Sunday is, this is our destination. This is what we exist for. This is what the whole universe exists for. That it will be drawn together in God. This is the point of our existence. And as we get closer to it, it's not something to shy away from or to fear. It's just something to anticipate and look forward to with excitement. Um, our redemption is drawing near. This is it. We, we're finally achieving our purpose. Um, and it's not us that's achieving it, but God is achieving it through us as we do that. And then he says there's a parable. A look at the fig tree. Um, and as you see, it's sprouts of leaves you know summer is coming when you see these signs begin to happen you know that the kingdom of god is near and so yeah um, when people try and uh, work out exactly which battle this is referring to and which war uh, and how close is the kingdom of god i think they're missing the point jesus is saying as this happens the kingdom of god is inexorably getting nearer and nearer and nearer um, and to be prepared. I look forward to it, anticipate it. Uh, verse 32, I tell you, this generation will certainly not pass away until these things have happened. And there's a lot of debate around what this generation means. Was it that generation existing at that point in time? Was it the generation of Christians as children of God? Um, is it, uh, um, how do we understand that? And some people say he's talking about those people that would still be alive when Jerusalem fell, which happened. Um, 
uh, there, yeah, there are various ways that people have understood that. Um, and the end uh, then says, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. And again, it's one of the, uh, the comforts and the, and the strengths we have is that uh, everything else is temporary. Even the universe is temporary. The sun, moon, and stars are temporary. They will eventually wind up and burn out or whatever um, and become insignificant and irrelevant and pass away. Uh, God's word is eternal. And therefore, if we're standing on God's word, we have something solid to stand on. And then he warns us, don't get caught up in the world. Be careful or your hearts will be weighed down with carousing, drunkenness and the anxieties of life. And that day will close on you suddenly like a trap. Um, in other words, keep your eyes on Jesus, not on the world, because it, it, the world will uh, pull the wool over your eyes and get you to focus on the wrong point. Uh, for it will come on all those who live on the face of the whole earth. This is something everybody faces. Be on your watch and pray that you'll be able to escape all that is about to happen. So we pray that... Um, the judgment and the suffering that is implicit in what is um, Jesus has said, that it's not going to happen, that we won't be part of it. And certainly many Christians through the ages have suffered in various ways, but have missed out on this. Um, and I think we, it's a prayer that, that we can, can have Jesus. Uh, may this not affect us directly. Uh, and then just at the end, each day he was, teaching and the people came early in the morning to hear him so clearly what he was saying resonated with the people of the time and they came to hear him eagerly right a very quick fly through and su quite superficial look at the, the chapter questions that you have comments you have things that you would see differently to me um, as I say time and again so everything I say is my perspective. I have been wrong in the past. I will be wrong in the future. Uh, uh, my ideas will pass away. God's words won't pass away. So <laughs> stick with what God's word is, um, not with what I say. So questions or comments or thoughts or uh, insights. Once. Brett, yes, your hand was up first. I just, I was actually thinking about this the other day, and I was, I was just praying that, um, that, 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 well, I'm able to, and everyone's able, well, I'm, I'm thinking just about myself here, yeah, that I'm able to escape this, what's going on, you know, that's mm -hmm. what's going to happen to the world. Yeah. I think it's uh, something we, we, we don't pray that we get involved in but it's um it's also when it happens it happens we can't avoid it um so yeah so what jesus exactly what he means when he says uh, uh, uh pray that you'll be able to escape all that is about to happen uh i think that might be uh a debatable point. It might also be that part of it, so not in this, not in Luke here, but certainly in other parts of the Bible where it talks about the end times, a lot of the, uh, the things that happen on earth happen as part of God's judgment on sin. And so we pray that we would be aligned with God and we would be standing with him. And therefore, if we are, we would we are not subject to the judgment. Um, and so that might be part of praying that we we can escape it, is that our faith will hold strong um, and that judgment on sin will not will not be visited on us. No. Jenny, you're also going to ask something? I was going to comment to, um, I think, what you said about... Um, well, Luke, as we know, was a historian, and I think he researched things incredibly well. And maybe, as you say, 
they're putting all the prophetic things together mm. and not necessarily specifying this is in the 70 years, this is then and that and then is, is probably, you know, the way to understand it. And, mm. um, and, and your example of the, of the pictures, photographs. <laughs> I know who I can mention that to in the future. <laughs> Uh, that, that, that wasn't uh, my idea. That, that I heard in a, a TV show from the UK that was looking at how scripture was put together, and that is an illustration that they used there, which I thought made a lot of sense. So, Very good. Uh, Thank you. Uh, uh, helpful perspective on, on scripture. Uh, yeah. Right. Uh, I think uh, one of the most important things is um, uh, verses 15 to 19, and that is stand firm and you will win life. And um, going back to the beginning of that at 15, because when you stand firm, he does give you the words and the wisdom mm -hmm. that none of your adversaries will be able to resist or contradict. Yeah. So even though at times it is frightening to stand firm, he does give you the strength to do that, and he does give you the words to mm. to get through it. Yeah. And my experience has been that where he says, I will give you the words, doesn't necessarily mean that you'll suddenly become erudite and be able to, to speak like a great orator and convince everybody. But you'll say things and in this stumbling way that you normally say things. Um, mm. And I found this sort of often with, with, with teaching and preaching, that you'll say things and people will, this will just be a phrase or something that God will use to speak to people and that will touch their hearts and that will, mm. will move them. And they'll say to you afterwards, oh, what you said here was so powerful. And reflect on what I said. Do, I didn't. That that wasn't <laughs> in my mind when I was saying that. And sometimes even as I'll, as they'll have heard something slightly different to what I was trying to say. Um, but God will speak through me, and God will use that to touch people. Mm -hmm. And so when Jesus says, "I will give you the words," um, we trust in that He will. Um, and and sometimes you you will say something. And then people will refer to it later and say, what you said, and you will not remember. Yeah. You will have no recollection because it was not your, your own words. Yes. Yeah. Right. And that's a great thing that, 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 that God, uh, God works. And he um, even sometimes works through us, which is... Um, uh, I, I'm always uh, encouraged and amazed at uh, that he can use people like me. Um, yeah. Ken? Yes. I, I've, I'm just um, struck by the, by the fact that our faith is not one that... Um, is based on a lack of action, if I can put it that way. Um, it's almost as if we are expected to be to be something in the world. Um, we are supposed to be seen to be followers of, of Christ, it, you know, mm. because all these things that that are spoken about here are, are, are happening because there's visibility. There is, there's almost a, a standpoint um, mm. that people have um, as Christians. So it, it just struck me that as is a, um, you know, I'm back of better words, but I, all, all I've got in my mm. head, it's a doing it's it's a verb it's 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 in motion it's not yeah. static it's not hidden it one yeah. has to be visible in faith and in 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 trust in god yeah i think that, 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 that's a good point because where jesus says 
before all this, they will seize you and persecute you and hand you over to synagogues and in prison. Now, if you're just quietly sitting in your corner of your room and minding your own business and not saying anything and not um, uh, disturbing anybody, they, they wouldn't come and hunt you down. They would just leave you because you. So if you're hidden away, you're hidden away. They, they couldn't care. But you look at what happened in the early church. That's not what happened. <laughs> the, the apostles stood up in the temple and began preaching and they got arrested and locked in jail. And the next day they were back in the temple continuing to preach. And it, they were out there uh, visibly um, preaching and making a difference and uh, living differently. And you, in Acts it says, um, everybody held them in, in high regard and many people, uh, they respected them, but they didn't want to join them because they, they were uncertain. And Christianity is never a, a, a private little me in my prayer closet and that's it. It is very much a, out in the world, living your faith out. And as you live out your faith, people will be offended and you will experience the persecution, but it is very much a, an out there um, in all you do, in all you say, shaping our attitude, shaping our words, uh, shaping our friendships, uh, being the determining factor in our life. And that will be offensive to people. If you just quietly hide in your room and be quiet, nobody's going to be offended. Uh, no one will notice. <laughs> and your witness will be pointless. There will be no witness. Uh, You'll be taking your light and pushing it under, putting it under a, a bushel, as Jesus warned us. So, yeah. Thanks, Angela. It's definitely not for the same passes, because it does, our faith does demand a lot of us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and yet God also, um, the... the, the Like that, that passage where he says you, you you haven't been tested tested beyond what you can endure, um, and God knows what what you can do, and He knows what His Spirit in you can do, and it may seem daunting, but He never puts you in out of your depth where you can't um, where you're going to fail. Um, he will He will get you like Peter walking in in amongst the waves. And if you keep your eyes fixed on him, you're, you're good. The minute you start looking at the waves around you, you're going to be sort of in trouble. So you keep your eyes on Jesus and the storm and the waves and everything is manageable. Um, but there will be storms and waves and uh, <laughs> be prepared. Yeah. Yes, and I find that, that the humiliation yeah. and rejection Sorry, yes, Brett? Oh, sorry, did I interrupt? Go ahead. Brett? No, I was just saying the humiliation and the rejection from, you know, that I come up against when I'm, when I'm um, you know, speaking to other WhatsApp groups or hmm. whatever it is, speaking to people, it can be a very hot and heated feeling of humiliation when, when, when you get rejected about it, it hurts when someone, and you take it personally, when someone rejects because of Christ, you know. Mm. Yeah. And then the encouraging thing is that, that in a sense, Jesus said, be prepared for it. That's what, what being my follower um, will entail. It doesn't make it easier, but it is an encouragement that, um, because the devil would have us believe that when you experience something like that, it's because you've done something wrong. Um, and Jesus is saying, no, it's, it's part of being faithful to me. So, yeah. But having said that, I'm a, I'm also, I have also come across Christians that, behave in ways and speak in ways which are unloving, uncharitable, um, condescending to everybody else, self-righteous um, and pharisaical. Um, 
and Jesus will have none of that. <laughs> and you read through the scriptures, and when people behaved that way, those were the people that, that incurred his wrath and indignation. Um, and so as Christians, we always have to be uh, gentle. We have to be loving. We have to be um, compassionate. We, we've got to model ourselves on Christ. Um, Right. So when do people anticipate or how do you anticipate the second coming? How does it shape your or, or f uh, feature in your daily walk with, with God? And we think um, we, we pray week by week, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Um, and what are we thinking? Well, <laughs> I think very often I'm thinking when we pray that. Um, but what might that be? Thy kingdom come. I think it's I think it's like I was thinking last night, you know, when you look through a pair of binoculars and then you you bring the two into focus, you know, mm. um, the, and then they start to come into focus. But I was thinking of two different two separate two like two separate things and then bringing the like to apply the target into, you know, to put it into one to, to have like yourself separate from Jesus but then have an experience of, of like when you having, I don't know if you call it an epiphany of when you have that, when Jesus is with you mm. and you feel, um, but with the second coming, I've never experienced that. Mm. I don't know what that looks like. But isn't it just like um, focusing on the core of our being to to make sure? Because, I mean, you know, if you use yoga, for an example, the exercises you can't do, but with practice, you build up your core and you can. So with faith and, and um, you build up your core so that you've got that mm. to rely on, to see you, to steer you. Mm. To when he comes. I think you know Jesus often spoke about um, you know the kingdom and said you know it was like this and like that and, um, and then comes back and then rewards the good and faithful servant. So for me, it is just being consistently doing what God calls, calls us to do, which is spending time with him, reading, praying, being with other Christians, getting involved, doing what he calls you to do, because we all call to do different things. And as you say, I think that is the ground on which we stand and, and the firmness. Um, we, we don't know. Um, and we're regularly told that we we won't know. <laughs> so, you know, although we pray that prayer, I see it also partly as praying in God's kingdom into situations in which we see are messed up but obviously it is the final coming and fulfillment and um, yes um, it's very difficult to even imagine sometimes you might have a very good imagination other days no but I think the core thing is as, as Nicole was saying is to just to be consistently faithful in what God has called you to do mm. I don't know um, if I've got the wrong end of the stick here, but you know, my, my interpretation of thy kingdom come mm. starts with the kingdom of, of God in me, um, living through me and directing me as my savior. And um, I guess the, the, the second coming, 
for me in terms of when all these events will come, I, I must say, I, I, I don't necessarily think of it. I'm just so in awe mm. with salvation as a start. <laughs> mm. um, I, I think I'm still, I'm still so amazed by the grace that mm. I must be honest, I, I, I don't, I'm not in the movie of when it happens and where will I be? I'm just, I'm just sorry. I don't know what happened there. I've got a call. Okay. (laughs) Um, But yeah, I think that's, that's where I am. So it's actually quite good to re to, to reread this part. Mm. Um, yeah. because I think yeah it, it's the yeah that's mm. just my contribution yeah. Good. I think one of the things that, that um, comes up uh, at various times in scripture is, is that it's going to take us by surprise I mean, people, uh, Jesus in the other passage says that there two people will be walking along a road. One will be taken and one will be left. Two women will be grinding wheat. One will be taken and one will be left. And so it really is, um, life will continue as normal. Uh, uh, and suddenly it will happen. And so, um, yeah, it is a, a case of we live our faith day by day. Um, uh with the knowledge, and it, it, it often ends up as a, sort of a, a background knowledge because we, we're engaging with our daily life and the needs of today and the challenges we face today from family and from people around about us and uh, what's happening in the world today. We live out our faith today, but we always need to, uh, almost in the back of our minds, have the 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 knowledge that this is an, an eternal issue um, and we're going through today because one day there will be the kingdom and we will see him face to face. Um, and we ready and we say, come Lord Jesus. Um, and if it come, if he comes at uh, quarter past eight tonight, just after we finished, hallelujah. <laughs> if he comes in a year's time, hallelujah as well. If it, if it only comes in a thousand years time, well, that's absolutely fine. Uh, we live with him, walk with him day by day, um, uh, always ready. It, it's uh, just referring to the, the anxieties of the world. Mm. It, when I personally feel those anxieties, I draw myself back to the Lord's Prayer and mm. it's not my will be done, it's thy will be done. Yes. And I have to, to focus myself back on that mm. to, to make sure I stay, stay the course. So yeah. mm. Yeah. And ultimately, thy will is the best will. Um, and certainly with with hindsight, I, I can see times where my schemes and my plans didn't come to fruition. <laughs> and I look back and think, just as well, because, my goodness, sort of, I'm in so much of a better place now than I would have been had that actually happened. Um, uh, you can see that, that down the road it would have been a, a, a disaster. Um, and as God works out his will day by day, um, it is always uh, his good, pleasing and perfect will. Um, and we, we trust that that's what he's doing. Right. Let us pray. Oh, Jesus, thank you that though heaven and earth will pass away, your words will never pass away. So thank you, Lord, that we have your words of encouragement. We have your words of promise. We have your words of challenge. Um, And I pray that you'd help us to hear your words, to trust your word, 
to live your word. And Lord, as we live in a world where we do see things going wrong and there are nations rising up against nation and there is hatred and there are families falling apart and it seems like an increase in suffering as year succeeds to year. We pray that you'll help us to, to walk more closely with you and shine more brightly for you in the world. Lord, help us to, to walk day by day, um, making, aligning ourselves with you so that we can make a difference in the world that we inhabit. And so, Lord, go with us into this night. Go with us through the rest of the week. Go with us through our lives. And we will be ever ready to meet you face to face. but always willing to serve you through others in our world. Jesus, we ask this in your name and for your glory. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm.